Hi there. Um, I'm Brian Tarbox, um, a community hero, uh, ambassador, user group leader, uh, new voices mentor, a bunch of other things. Um, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to warn you folks that are standing up, um, this is going to be a very, very weird talk, and you may just prepare yourself. We're not talking about Gen AI. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. It's, it's one hour into the show, and we're already like, okay, enough already with, uh, with, with, <laughs> with, with Gen AI. Um, so we're going to talk about <clears throat> uh, protect, um, lowering your, protecting your S3 cost and also uh, protecting your S3 data. And the thing to remember is S3, S3 is where we put our data. And, you know, robbers go to the bank because that's where, to rob because that's where the money is. Bad guys go to S3 because that's where, that's where the data is. And when you get uh, attacked, you don't just lose um, the data. You, you have, there's reputation losses, um, uh, legal fees. Uh, one of my uh, good friends had a business, a uh, private business of his, uh, get bankrupted by an attack. Um, he had all his data on-prem, and he got attacked. And I said, what about your backups? And he said, well, they were safely on-prem as well, so I could see them. And of course, the first thing the bad guys did was you know, destroy his, his backup data. Um, uh, and paying doesn't assure that you get the data back, because um, these, these are bad guys, by the way. There is one company, and I won't mention their name, but uh, they had all their data in the cloud. But they didn't have good security practices. They weren't protected. They got ransomed, um, effectively ransomed. Uh, they paid the bad guys off. The bad guys gave them their keys back, and then the company didn't do anything. The next month, the bad guys locked their data again. <laughs> And they had to pay again. And then they hired somebody to actually put some security practices um, uh, in place. So don't be that company. Um, and you know, ransomware is just going nuts. Uh, if it isn't, it says by 2031, uh, an attack every two seconds, it's probably uh, more than that by now. But it doesn't matter if it's your data, because you don't care about the frequency as long as it's not your data. So there's a couple things you should do. Um, these are some of my bucket names. These are terrible, terrible bucket names. And after the show, I'm going to change them. So, you know, have at it right now if you want to, but or, or, or don't. Um, but BJT, those are my initials, Terraform State. If you were a bad person, you would attack that because then you, can, you have access to my Terraform State. So don't make it obvious. I worked at a genomics company. Um, you know, hundreds of petabytes of data. And the main bucket was our genomic data. <laughs> you know, don't do that. Don't do that. That's it. You're, you're, just, just, you're just asking asking for trouble. Now, when we tried to, to change that, the developers pushed back and said, oh, I don't want to learn that XYZ123 is genomics data. And we're like, tough. Put a sticky on your laptop. You know, um, but don't advertise to, to the bad guys that, that that's what you're doing. Um, the developers can, can get over it. Um, and I guess I shouldn't at a security conference be saying, oh my god, did I just say put a sticky next to your laptop? Put it in LastPass as a secured note. You know. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about um, cost, because cost is another, it, it, cost is part of security. Um, so uh, S3, of course, has um, you know lots of different storage classes. Um, there, there's technically more than six, six, actually technically more than five. But we're not going to talk about the um, single zone because that's just wrong. I'm just, I just can't imagine doing single zone. Um, so you can tune per, for performance and cost. Now the assumption in all of this is that you understand how you're using your data. You don't. I mean. I've, I've yet to run into a company that really, really understood how all of their data was being used by all of their programs. You may think you, do, you know, and if you do, uh, ping me, because I want to know who, who you are, but most, most people don't. So understanding the, the, the deep usage patterns of your data and explicitly programming for that is hard. So. This is a little bit of an eye chart, but the, the interesting bit is, you know, there's standard access, infrequent, 
My favorite, Glacier Instant Retrieval. Who came up with this name? Glacier Instant. Excellent. Um, and their sizes and durations. But the, the, the most interesting bit to me is the retrieval charge, in that there's no, there's no retrieval charge for standard access, but there is a retrieval charge for, for the other ones. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, latency, it's all pretty even until you get to um, the, the deep archive and the flexible retrieval. The, it's really interesting that Glacier Instant Retrieval is not noticeably slower than standard access. We did tests. My, at, again, at the, this one of these companies that I can't mention or should mention, nope, my boss, and no, they wouldn't believe me. They said, it can't, be, it can't be just as fast because it's cheaper. And it's like, but it is. We've done, we've done tests. Um, and then the prices. And so, you know, standard is 100%. Um, infrequent is half. Uh, it's, it's interesting. These two really intrigue me, that you only get 2% price benefit going from Glacier Flexible, which has millisecond response time, to Glacier, Glacier Instant to going to Glacier Flexible. You only get 2%. So what's, 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 the, value, what's the value there? Okay. Then we get to intelligent hearing. And there's a concept that I want you to walk away from uh, this talk with. And, and we're going we're gonna to lead to it. And that intelligent hearing is a storage class. Within intelligent hearing, there are tiers that correspond to the other storage classes. And the tier transitions are based on access. So when you're doing intelligent tiering, the, sit, the file, the objects get moved around for you based on the access. And that's where we go back to the, it doesn't, you don't need to understand how your data is used. It's just, it's used as it is, and intelligent tiering will move it around as it needs to. Now, they say there's three normal tiers. That's the standard, uh, infrequent, and glacier instant and then the two, the two slower glacier ones. And I don't recommend using those, at least um, in general. And here's the key part. All the metrics are the same except for the cost. So notice, notice the green here. If you're in um, infrequent access tier of intelligent tiering class, there's no access charge, OK? Um, and. Uh, I mean, there is, there's a tiny management charge, but the management charge is, really is tiny, and intelligent hearing doesn't apply to really small objects anyway, so you won't get hit with that. And why does this matter? Because, again, at this genomics company, uh, hundreds and hundreds of petabytes of, of data. Um, and we do the genomic analysis, and we save people's lives, and it was really pretty cool. Um, it's actually very cool to have a system where if we were down, people legitimately died. I mean, that gives you some, some real motivation to... to, to do, do things right. But then somebody said, well, let's take all that data, let's take the hundreds of petabytes of data, and let's put it in regular, regular infrequent access. And they say 50%, and they were uh, so happy, and they gave themselves raises and bonuses, and oh, it was great. And then the FDA came in and said, you know those tests you ran, we'd like you to run those again. And they had to take all those hundreds of petabytes of data and bring it back. And that took time and incredible amounts of money um, and they, got, they felt they were really burned, and they're like, we're never going to do infrequent access um, again. And then I spent six months trying to teach them that intelligent tiering infrequent access did not have um, that charge. And literally, it took me six months where I said, please let me push the button. I will save you $3 million. Let me push the button. And finally, they pushed the button. We saved $3 million. Um, so it's, it's just, it, you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, so uh, storage, classes, storage classes with an intelligent tiering is great. Um, you, can do life, you, can do the, you can transition things between storage classes uh, manually. You can do them using these lifecycle rules. The rules can apply to whole buckets. They can apply based on conditions, prefixes, and so on. And the rules are based on the object creation time not the access time. So when you're playing with S3, really pay attention to, are you doing, dealing with something that pays attention to access time, which changes all the time as you use it, or creation time, which is just once. Now, the lifecycle transition rules fire at midnight UTC, but there's no SLA on the execution time. We actually asked Amazon, hey, we have 100 million objects we want to move um, from SA to IT. How long is that going to take? And they said, we don't know which is an awesome answer to get from Amazon. Um, and we said, is it we don't know like it might be a minute or 
12 or we don't know, like it might be an hour or four weeks. And they're like, we don't know. They said, go, go do it and then let us know what the answer is. It's like, that's awesome. Um, so, uh, so transitions are good. Um, so now let's talk about object lock. Object lock is, is the other amazing thing. So ask yourself, how bad would it be if you lost all your data? Um, presumably, presumably pretty bad. It, it's, it's, it's an existential event. Um, and I'm a big fan of defense in depth. So yeah, have your SCPs, have your ACLs, have your policies, all that. But assume that the bad guys get in somehow. S3 object lock is the one thing you can do that will give you an absolute defense against an object um, being deleted. If you set, depending on how you set it up, you can't delete the object and Amazon can't delete the object. Now, there are lots of caveats, and we're going to get into that. That's the point of the talk. Okay, so there's two different modes, and then there's retention period. There's compliance mode and governance mode. And this, again, my background is in, is in linguistics, and I, I don't like these names. Um, <laughs> and I always have to look at the slide to tell which one is which. But in governance mode, no one can delete the object unless you have the permission that says I can delete, I can change um, governance re retention period. Um, and that's a permission that most people have never heard of, so security by obscurity may get away with it. Um, but then in compliance mode, nobody, and I promise you, nobody um, uh, can, can get rid of it. Now the retention period is how long the lock stays on. So you say, I want a lock of one of these two types and I want it for a certain amount of time. Um, and you can't, shorten the length of time, but you can lengthen it, so pay attention to that. Um, continuing the theme of good naming, um, there's a, an indefinite retention period that they've called legal hold. I would have called it indefinite retention period, but I'm not in charge of um, the naming, but so, so be it. Okay. Um, have to understand a little bit about uh, versioning. Um, most of us, lots of people uh, turn on versioning because that's a security measure. Uh, not as much as you think. But we turn on versioning and then we, pay, we don't pay any attention to it. We turn off display version in the console um, and so we just, we have versioning. Um, when, you're, when, you put, um, uh, when you put an object to an unversioned bucket, it's a create. Um, it, it's not, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not an update. It's a replace, not an update. When you put, uh, when, you, when you do to put on a version bucket, you, you push down the old version and you create a new one. Um, and each one of those versions has its own object locked setting. Now, we're going to talk a little bit, real briefly, about denial by wallet, which is, uh, if I was a bad guy, and I'm really not, but if I was a bad guy, denial by wallet is absolutely how I would do the attack. Um, every time you, you pay for how, many, how much storage you have, Suppose you have some really big objects and a bad actor got in and made copies of those objects, made new versions of, the, made new versions of those objects. You wouldn't notice it. I promise you, you wouldn't notice it. And if I was clever and did it slowly, you would think that just your costs are going up because our costs are going up. That must mean we're being successful. We have more customers. No, you're being attacked, but you're just not paying attention to it. And you would absolutely never n notice it. And so denial by wallet... Um, I, I guess I can say bad, how to do bad things because I'm also going to tell you how not to get hit, hit by it. So, sorry. Just realize, oh, geez, am I wearing a black hat here? But denial by wallet is pretty cool. Um, uh, because you have all these objects, you have, you know, uh, S3, S3, all of these things don't really matter until you have lots and lots of objects that are really, really big. And once you have lots and lots of objects, you have to, you, it's uh, interesting to have tools to play with them. Uh, inventory is one of the tools you can use you know, to figure out where your objects are, where they live. Batch lets you um, do operations on the list that come out of inventory. Um, batch has uh, a limited number of things it can do to this list, but object lock is one of them. So you can control the object lock. Now, as Amazon usually does, they have the escape valve in that you can call a lambda. So if you, wanted, if you had 100 million objects and you wanted to do something in batch that wasn't supported by batch, S3 batch, um, you could fire off a lambda, and you could fire off 100 million, you, you know, the lambda 100 million times. Still, probably wouldn't cost you much, but it's it's a little awkward. Try not try not to do that. Um, so, horror stories. Horror stories are the best part. Um, so, um, uh, we had a company um, uh, that put a seven-year compliance mode lock 
on 100 petabytes of data. The wrong data. <laughs> they put it on their test bucket. <laughs> um, and now they are going to pay for that 100 petabytes of test data for seven years. And there is nothing they can do about it. Um, I, actually, I actually know of two companies that have done this. Um, uh, one company, uh, they're, just, they're, they're just living with it. Another company is actually trying to delete their account and create a new account. And so they're having to move everything. Just imagine, imagine what it would take, take a minute of, of horror and think what it would take to move your entire company's infrastructure to a different account because someone clicked on the wrong button when they said they were going to save you money. Um, that's, how you, that's how you get fired or sued. Um, so that's, um, so there, there's really, you, you need to be careful. Okay, so the call to action is this is, this is the only safe way to do it. Um, test object lock um, with a short retention period, like a week, okay? And put it in governance mode. Um, and you put it in governance mode so that if something breaks, you can turn it off. What could break, Brian? Well, that app that you didn't know about that fails unless it can delete an object. Maybe you've put this on some temporary bucket or uh, bucket of temporary objects where an application needs to be able to delete, and it has failed. Okay, I promise you, you won't know that until it happens. So put it in a short retention period, governance mode. Wait for a week. See if things see if things blow up. Try it for a slightly longer retention period. And only then go to compliance mode. Um, and you can use batch and inventory to extend the retention period. So run it in compliance mode for a month and set up a batch that automatically at the end of the month extends it for another month. I would say never do it for more than three months or whatever your you know, uh, CFOs are, are, are comfortable with. Um, and then also, oh, for the, for the denial by wallet, um, we go back to the lifecycle rules. You can set up rules that say how many versions of an object I can have. So you can say never have more than two versions of an object so the denial by wallet attack simply won't work. You'll have your object. You've put a lock on it. Um, if someone gets to do a put, your object gets pushed down to the versioned object and the bad object is up here. But then uh, further attempts to do puts will, will not work. This object will be preserved because it's an object lock. There will not be new versions, and you're guaranteed to be able to go back. Um, and that's, that's the, how you protect your wallet, protect your S3, avoid getting fired for doing something that destroys your company. Um, and that is it. Thank you so much.